Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's nice to see everyone, and you're all sitting tight. Um, as Solomon just said, my name is Kate, and I am a reference librarian downstairs in the Performing Arts Reading Room, which is on the first floor of this building where the Bernstein Collection is served, if you haven't been before. Um, you know, just need to get a reader ID card, and you can come check it out for yourself. So um, I love musical theater. I have since I was probably like 10 years old or something, and I there are certain moments when I work here that I just have to kind of think of my 12-year-old self. And one of those moments was today, lay, laying out West Side Story materials on the table and thinking, remembering seeing the movie for the first time and having no idea that I would be touching manuscripts of the man who made the music. So I'm really excited to be here. How many people come here or came here thinking West Side Story is my favorite? Thing. I had a few comments like that at the table, is why I asked. Okay, actually, okay, great. Um, <laughs> you love it. Well, for those of you who are true Bernstein and West Side Story geeks out there, um, before I really get going, I just want to make a plug. Um, Nigel Simeone, he wrote this book. It's called Leonard Bernstein, West Side Story. And it is, um, I mean, there's so much material, of course, written about Bernstein and his collaborators and his music. But this book, if you are really, really wanting to get into the nitty gritty of how this musical came to be, um, this is reading for you. And as a reference librarian, I just kind of had to make that suggested reading. And I use um, it as a resource for my talk. Um, OK. So we'll get, we'll, we will get started. Um, many of you know, make sure this works. So many of you know that West Side Story, it actually previewed here in Washington, DC, um, right before it went to open in Broadway um, on September 26, 1957, uh, at the Winter Garden Theater. And though today is a mini fest for Bernstein and it's his centennial and that's our focus, this show is really as legendary as it is because of the all-star collaborating team that was working on it. So I just wanna run through that team again for those of you um, who, who may not know the history as well, just make sure we're all on solid ground. So we start with Leonard Bernstein himself. He wrote the music. We have Arthur Lawrence, who wrote the book. Stephen Sondheim, who uh, was the lyricist. This is a photo, uh, I used this photo, this is of him in the souvenir program for West Side Story. So you get a sense for how young he was when he was working on this. He was in his 20s, it's his Broadway debut. And Jerome Robbins, who was the choreographer and the director of the show. Um, and to really get at the beginnings, beginnings of West Side Story and how it came to be a production to begin with, we really do start with Jerome Robbins. Um, back in 1949, he was talking to, uh, Jerome Robbins was actually talking to a friend, and his friend had been offered the part of Romeo in Shakespeare's play. And his friend was trying to understand the character of Romeo, um, trying to process it some. So he was talking to Robbins, and Robbins started to try and help him and started to think about Romeo in a modern day context. And suddenly a light bulb went off, and he thought, hey, this would be a great project for Broadway. So he turned to Bernstein and to Arthur Lawrence right away and um, asked them if they were into the project. The next slide. One of, the, um, one of the many, many writings we have in the Bernstein collection um, in his hand is this writing, it's called Excerpts from a West Side Log. Um, and what I should say, this is a journal of events um, documenting the, the creative process involved in West Side Story and its history. But I will add a caveat, this is 
it's an invented log of sorts. He wrote this uh, to be published in the, in the Broadway playbill. So he wrote this after they got through all of the events. It's sort of his memory log, we'll say. But um, I wanted to read the first entry in that West Side log. It says, uh, New York, 6 January, 1949. Jerry R. called today with a noble idea, a modern ver version of Romeo and Juliet, set in slums at the coincidence of Easter Passover celebrations. Feelings running high between Jews and Catholics, former Capulets, latter Montagues. Juliet is Jewish. Friar Lawrence is a neighborhood druggist. Street brawls, double death, it all fits. It's all much less important than the bigger idea of making a musical uh, tell a tra that tells a tragic story in musical comedy terms, using only musical comedy techniques, never falling into the operatic trap. I'm excited. Jerry suggests Arthur Lawrence for the book. I don't know him, but I do know Home of the Brave, at which I cried like a baby. He sounds just right. So that is the, um, <clears throat> the first entry. And there, there's actually a couple things going on in that first entry that you can take away from it. But the biggest one that I heard a, a, some acknowledgment of, um, that this is about Juliet being Jewish, and this is about Jewish Catholic tensions, uh, not what we are used to with West Side Story, of course. Um, and indeed, Lawrence has talked about how um, in Shakespeare never I specified what the conflict was actually going to be between the two feuding houses. So that was one of the first things they had to grapple with. And they landed on that religious tension at first. Um, but they also thought that that wasn't really a very fresh idea in a lot of ways. Uh, that, so that's the late 40, 1949. The project actually goes quiet for a while. Um, people have different projects. It's not really coming together. Um, it's about six years go by before momentum starts building again. So it's 1955 we're at. Um, and in 1955, Arthur Lawrence happens to be in Hollywood, and Bernstein goes out to Hollywood. He's conducting something at the Hollywood Bowl. And uh, they are hanging out, lounging by the Beverly Hills Hotel pool. And they are, and they, I, I believe both of them have uh, confirmed this memory with each other, um, that they were reading the newspapers, hanging out by the pool, reading the, the headlines. And there were so many headlines at the time about gang violence, Chicano gang violence in LA. And as they were reading it, they started to think, hmm, maybe this is something we could work with. And uh, I believe Bernstein even threw out the idea, well, we could set it here in LA. And Arthur Lawrence didn't really love that idea. He wanted to keep it in New York City um, and decided, and so through talking about that, they talked about um, the Puerto Rican community in New York City, decided that was a way they could go. and suddenly things start to fall together. Things start to fall into place. There are musical uh, influences that are you know, abounding in that. And then Jerry Robbins can incorporate all of this um, Latin dancing into his choreography as well. So everyone was excited. And um, so ultimately, we shift from religious tension on the Lower East Side, where it was originally going to take place, to uh, race relations on the Upper West Side. And it wasn't until the fall of 1955 that Stephen Sondheim was brought in on the project. There's one, there's one transcript in the collection that I personally really love. It's, um, it's a transcript of an interview that Terrence McNally conducted with all four collaborators in 1985 for the Dramatist Guild. And I, I, I don't believe we know about a recording or, or that we have access to a recording of that interview. But if you're interested in this topic, like 
going through the whole creative process of the show. It's a, it's a fabulous transcript because they're all talking together and they're all interrupting each other and saying, well, no, that's not how I remember that at all. And you know, they're all shooting these different memories back and forth. Um, and that's one of the things about West Side Story is that each person has their own perspective and their own memory of how things went. Um, but at one point in the transcript, they're talking about the book, about Lawrence's book. And um, Robbins points out that you know one of the beauties of, the, of his book is that he was able to stick to the outline, um, the Shakespeare outline, uh, fairly well without it feeling like he's driving it home too hard on the audience, like it doesn't feel totally forced. Um, Sondheim chimed in and said he thought the hardest task for Lawrence was finding a modern day substitute for Shakespeare's filter and the potion. Um, in his words, how somebody takes potion and seems to be dead and then comes alive again. Uh, that was something they had to work through a lot, and a lot of the early um, versions that they they played with, they, they did have both Romeo and Juliet characters dying, be it you know suicide um, or what. Um, I particularly liked Lawrence's comment on this topic. He he responded right away that the thing, in his words, the thing I'm proudest of in telling the story is why she can't get the message through she being Anita, why Anita can't get the message through to Tony. Because of prejudice, I think it's better than the original story. Um, and, you know, I could really get into the weeds about um, more little twists and turns in, the, in how the show came together, but when I started to do that, my lecture started to look like <laughs> Nigel Simeone's book here. So, what I want to do is just kind of go through a couple of the things that I have on my display table that you may or may not have had a chance to look at yet. And then we'll get to the music as well. And hopefully there's time at the end for questions and we can kind of gear it toward what you all are particularly interested in hearing more about. Um, so if you're curious, I'm using, I, I'll use the word curious, or maybe slightly gossipy like I am, then one of the most fun types of things that you can come across in this type of collection and looking at this type of um, show are casting notes, audition notes, looking at what it really was that the team was writing next to each person's name as they auditioned for the show. Um, this one sheet, I. I included in my PowerPoint, and it's, it's on the table. You probably saw it. It's from Tuesday, May 7th, 1957. And I did want to also just, if I click here, I wanted to make, make it really clear that some of the material you see out on display today is, in, is, is digitized and is available online. Um, as a part of our contribution to the Bernstein Centennial this year, we actually expanded our Bernstein online collection um, quite substantially. So you can go home and you can noodle around on our website and get an up close look at a lot of this material that you see, including the casting notes. And I chose this one so that we could zoom in and really get a read on the situation. Um, so on this day, we have a couple of uh, standout names. We have Cheetah Rivera. Uh, she got a clean check mark. She auditioned for Anita. Uh, they didn't really need to say anything else about her, I guess. We have Lee Becker. Uh, Lee Becker auditioned for Anybody's, and she was indeed cast as um, Anybody's. She got a check mark as well, but an, an added little terrific. Terrific. Um, and then the other really noteworthy one, Larry Kurt is on the list. Larry Kurt was cast as Tony. He's the original Tony. Um, but on this day, he was auditioning for Bernardo. Uh, and there are a couple of notes next to his name. Uh, it, we have gotten older, great singer and performer, but looks, <laughs> and red riff better. So you don't know where you're going to find. Um, also down here, another standout name, Carol Lawrence. She auditioned for Maria. And there, 
there's a check mark and a question mark next to her name. Mm -hmm. uh, and it says, lovely soprano, not quite Maria, much realer with accent. Uh, let's see. And then t a couple names beneath her, Tony Mordenti. His name is actually spelled incorrectly there. It's an E on the end. Um, but he auditioned <coughs> for Baby John, an action. Um, he was actually cast uh, in the end as Arab. And um, he actually ended up marrying Cheetah Rivera in 1959. And there is a little nod to that relationship on my display table. I don't have time to go into it right now, but it's a little teaser, so you can come by and see after I talk, and we can talk it through over at the table. OK. And again, um, these and more are available online. Oh, and I was going to say um, that a little over a week later, there is another uh, casting note sheet with some other fun names that you'd recognize, um, Suzanne Plachette. The only note next to her name is horse. Um, oh, sorry. The vocal. <laughs> Good question. Vocal quality. Um, Jerry Orbach. He auditioned for Chino. Uh, Good read. Good loud baritone. And Warren Beatty, who auditioned for Riff. Good voice. Can't open jaw. Charming as hell. <laughs> so um, next, ah uh, yes, we have a few photographs of um, Bernstein in, in rehearsals with the cast. This one here on the slide, you can see Bernstein in the, in the white uh, turtleneck there. Carol Lawrence is in the striped dress next to him, and that is Stephen Sondheim at the keyboard um, accompanying. Uh, there's another one right after, yes, kind of the same scene. I love these photos. Everything looks so happy and fun and you know jovial, um, but it's true that, I mean, if, if you know anything about Jerome Robbins, um, you know that he, he ran a tight ship and uh, rehearsals were no laughing matter with him. Um, he was big on method, method acting, and so he would notoriously kind of make each gang eat lunch separately from one another. Um, I should have mentioned this earlier. A couple people asked me earlier, who's anybody's again? Anybody's is um, the, the tomboy character who wants to be a jet, but they're, you know, they keep pushing her aside and saying really mean things to her the whole show. Um, I, I read in one place that as a result of him making each gang eat separately with who they wanted to eat with, Lee Becker didn't have anyone to eat with because the sharks wouldn't want her and the jets were kind of like, get out of here. Um, but uh, Carol Lawrence has recalled, um, this is a quote from her recounting rehearsals she said, to keep us from slipping out of character, Jerry would ask us questions about our parents. Not our real parents, but the parents of the characters we were playing, even if those parents weren't mentioned in the show. We humane, civilized actors became the hate-filled, violent street gangs we were portraying. Violence and sexual intimidation, fights and injuries, you name it. It was going on and getting worse. Um, the slightest mistake in a dance step, gesture, or word met a fate worse than death. But by contrast, she also um, remembers Bernstein during those rehearsals. And she said that in, in contrast, I mean, he was you know, supportive and sensitive. And she said, very often after Jerry took us apart, Lenny would put us back together again. So I guess these photos with Bernstein, it makes sense that they all look happy. <laughs> Um, and back to Bernstein, and let's start talking about the music some. Um, the score is so beloved. <laughs> it was really hard to pick what we we're going to talk about today. Um, but the, we, are, we do kind of have this cut songs theme going on. So let's start with a cut song. Um, 
There are several numbers that were cut, ultimately, and you can find manuscripts for them in the Bernstein collection. Um, there's a song, Mix, which we're going to talk about in a second. This Turf is Ours. These were both um, written for the end of the opening scene originally, and another trio called Like Everybody Else. Um, that was for anybody's Arab and Baby John, um, but that didn't make it to, to the final production. And then on the flip side, there was always this intention, I should say, that Maria would have a final aria where she has her big speech at the end when Tony is, is killed. Um, Bernstein really tried to make that work and he like repeated attempts and it just never worked. Arthur Lawrence really wanted that musicalized. It just never happened. So it, it remained a speech at the end. But we're gonna talk about mix and we're gonna listen to it in a minute. Um, so you know how the Jet song comes right after that prologue. Um, that's our introduction to them. Well, originally, there was going to be a rumble at the start of the show. And Mix was the song that was going to go with that rumble. So it's for the Jets. Here, I think I've... Here we go. Here's the, the cover of the manuscript. It says, male chorus, riff, uh, riff, action, diesel, baby John, mouthpiece. So it's for them. I'm going to start the show. And I think we'll just start by listening to an arrangement we've made. Um, that John Kalbleich and our, our lovely singer, well, first our, our, remind me of your name. Ben. Ben will perform for us right now, okay? And then we'll talk about it. Mix, make a mess of them. Pay the Puerto Ricans back, make a mess of them. If you let us take a crack, there'll be less of them. There'll be less of them. Mix, we can cut them up. If you only say the word, we can cut them up. Go ahead and say the word and we'll shut them up. We can shut them up. Spix, every one of them's chicken, chicken. Fix them, give the suckers a lick. And if those brown little bums are looking for kicks, every brown little greasy son of a Puerto Rican gets a kisser full of bricks. Make a mess of them. Make the son of a bitches pay, make a mess of them. When the smoke is cleared away, there'll be less of them. There'll be less of them. Mix! Riff, we've been spoiling. Our motor needs an oiling. Our radiator's boiling. Riff, let's get going. Our Dyna flow is flowing. Our safety valves are blowing. Give them the gun, give them the gun, give them the gun. Make them run, let's make them run, let's make them run. Spix, every one of them's chicken, chicken. Fix them, give the circus a lick. And if those brown little thrones are looking for kicks, every brown little greasy son of a Puerto Rican gets a kisser full of bricks. Make a mess of them. Make the son of a bitch's pay, make a mess of them. When the smoke is cleared away, there'll be less of them. There'll be less of them. There'll be less of them. Less and less of them. Less of them. Less of them. Mix! Thank you so much. So this song has a lot of bite to it. It's aggressive. Um, what you all... Um, probably noticed, and I'm sure Ben would agree with me, there are a lot of words. words yeah. There are a lot of words to fit into that. Yeah. And if we can imagine a whole chorus <laughs> um, trying to get those words out, that posed a problem. So that was, one, it, that was one issue and one reason that this had to go. But um, how many choral singers do we have here today? Because we're in DC, so you should be here. OK. Um, <laughs> Great, so, so some, some people probably know where I'm going already with this, yeah. Well, just go with me. <laughs> yes, there we go. So um, let's, let's kind of fast forward, if you will. We'll take a, a really short departure from West Side Story. Um, it's 1963, and Walter Hussey is the dean of Chichester Cathedral in Sussex, and he's particularly um, passionate about the arts, and he gets in touch with 
Leonard Bernstein, and he says, uh, you know, I'd, we're going to have a, we have a, a summer, a yearly summer festival of music, and in 1965, it's going to be at Chichester Cathedral. We would love it if we could commission a work from you, a choral work. So Bernstein agrees. We have that correspondence in the Bernstein collection here. Um, he accepts with pleasure. Uh, and then on August 14th, 1964, there's this letter here that Hussey wrote to Bernstein, and, he, and they're talking about the commission, and he's giving him some, some um, information about you know, the performing forces, um, how big the chorus is going to be. And he adds in, at the very bottom, he says, I hope you will feel quite free to write as you wish and will in no way feel inhibited by circumstances. I think many of us would be very delighted if there was a hint of West Side Story about the music. <laughs> and for those of you who don't know Chichester Psalms, it's a three movement work um, and the, of psalm settings though they're in Hebrew. And um, let's listen. We're going to listen to a short clip from Movement 2. Um, it starts out, Movement 2 starts out with a boy soprano who is um, singing, uh, the, the text is, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. So it's this he, there's a harp that introduces him, and he sings this beautiful, just soaring, uh, uh, line, and um, it gets interrupted by something in contrasting style, and you probably have an idea of what that might be, but let's give it a listen for just a minute, okay? Um, Bernstein reuses that material um, in Chester, Chester Psalms, and it works because that part of the text, it's not Psalm 23, it's, it's a Psalm 2, so it's why do the nations rage? Um, so he's really juxtaposing faith and fear um, both with the text and also with the music. It works beautifully, and it's in Hebrew. <laughs> so it's hard to know what they're saying anyways when they're singing so fast. <laughs> um, I should have also mentioned, you, you noticed that was Leonard Bernstein conducting in 1989, so very close to the end of his life. Um, okay, the next song that we'll look at is not a cut song, but it has kind of a fun story to it. Um, and that song is One Hand, One Heart, which you all know change in mood. <laughs> and um, let me go to the next slide so you can see. Oh, and that's, sorry, this is a, a just a page of the manuscript score for Chichester Psalms. So you see that boy solo part, the Adonai, um, and then you have the men coming in with a la, ma. All right. So on to one hand, one heart. Here is this is the earliest um, music manuscript for the song in the collection. Uh, it was at first just called One. Uh, and you can also see, if you look closely, that originally it says balcony scene, and that's crossed out in red, and it says wedding above it. 
so it was actually, and you'll also see it in the corner, it says Act One, Scene Four. Um, down the line, it's farther down in, in Act One, um, scenes, several scenes forward. Um, so originally, they were thinking of this song of using it in the famous balcony scene where Tonight Now is. And they had already started to write it, and Bernstein actually borrows, <laughs> again, he's borrowing music material from Candide. James talked about Candide earlier. He was working on them pretty much at the same time. And uh, there was material that was going to be used um, along with a marriage ceremony scene in Candide that ultimately got scrapped and it gets repurposed here in West Side Story. So if I click on the first page here, we're used to seeing um, the, at the beginning of the song, you know, make of our hands one hand. Um, here it's just stretched out in um, without those those opening quarter notes. It's just uh, opening dotted half notes, one hand, one heart. Um, it was, Bernstein wrote this, again, as I said, he, he borrowed it from material that he was using for Candide. Um, when Sondheim came on board, it was kind of relatively late into the rehearsal process, from what I understand. And Sondheim was kind of scratching his head saying, can you just make some changes to this line? Because there are like no words going on. Can we at least, can we change the lyrics some or add some, um, some interest to them? And Bernstein kind of put him off for a long time, but then in the end, he did make a few changes. So what we're gonna listen to now is um, a performance based on one of the manuscripts of One Hand, One Heart earlier than, than the final version we know. And we'll hear what it would sound like maybe if Sondheim had not been quite so insistent.
verse 2. To, to wrap up that story of one, in Sondheim's words, I realized I couldn't set any two-syllable words to the song, and it had to be one, all one-syllable words. <laughs> I was stifled and down in Washington, and after endless pleas, Lenny put in two little quarter notes that I could make, make of our, as in make of our hearts one heart. Not a great deal, but at least a little better. <laughs> And um, since I'm bringing up Sondheim, I wanted to close out my talk um, describing one item that I, I do have out on the table, and I know a lot of you have already had a chance to look at it. Um, and it's a letter that Sondheim wrote to Bernstein on opening day of the, of the musical of West Side Story on Broadway. So he wrote it on September 26th, 1957, and um, if you'll indulge me, I'm just going to read the letter out loud for those of you who haven't had a chance to look at it. He wrote, Dear Lenny, you know only too well how hard it is for me to show gratitude and affection, much less to commit them to writing. But tonight I feel I must. West Side Story means much more to me than a first show, more even than the privilege of collaborating with you and Arthur and Jerry. It marks the beginning of what I hope will be a long and enduring friendship. Friendship is a thing I give and receive rarely, but for what it's worth, I want you to know that you have it from me always. I don't think I've ever said to you how fine I think the score is, since I prefer kidding you about the few moments I don't like to praising you for the many I do. West Side Story is as big a step forward for you as it is for Jerry or Arthur or even me, and in an odd way, I feel proud of you. Much as I want to write music, I'm not sure I like the idea of doing another show without you. I will, of course, and I'll play it for you, and you'll criticize it, and I'll be hostile and sarcastic about your criticism, <laughs> but I look forward to that criticism, and I hope you'll give it freely. My gratitude and affection, then, and also my best wishes for good luck to our little divertissement. May West Side Story mean as much to the theater and to the people who see it as it has to us. Steve. And it, yes, Sondheim. <laughs> and um, I couldn't really think of better words to close this on, to be honest with you. I'm. Um, from those of you who've walked by the table, I've had a couple of people say, this is my favorite show. This means so much to me. Um, so it really has meant that much to so many people. And I am going to close out my talk now. We have time for some questions. So I would be more than happy to answer questions if, if anybody has something. There's a mic coming around, so speak into the mic so that the cameras can pick it up. Hi. Uh, Hi. Is there any uh, material in the collection related to the making of the film version in 61 um, and Bernstein's response to it? Not, I did not focus at all on the film when I was preparing this talk. Um, I am not familiar with material spe specific to it. I'm kind of like looking over for Mark Horowitz to, <laughs> <laughs> to advise me. Are you familiar with? There's a little bit of correspondence. OK. The, the creators were not big fans of the film. He said the creators were not big fans of the film. There's a little bit of correspondence in the collection, but not a lot that relates to the film. Uh, what were the collaborations uh, <clears throat> between Sondheim and Bernstein after that, after West Side Story? 
Mark. <laughs> Mark, I should say, Mark, you all, many of you know Mark Horowitz, and he's going to speak after me. Uh, it's a little nerve-wracking to answer questions about, a little bit about Bernstein, but definitely about Stephen Sondheim, because he is the authority here at the library on Stephen Sondheim. So that's why I keep not looking over to him. <laughs> the answer to the question is they really only worked on one other thing together, which was, had various titles of Pray by Left, the race to Urga and the exception of the rule, which were based on a Brecht play, it went very bad. Um, Sondheim backed out of the project. He didn't want to do it to begin with. He basically did it as a favor of Lenny. And um, John Ware took, began working on the libretto. And the lyrics started be, being done by the guys who wrote Jailhouse Rock. <laughs> not, not Jailhouse. Um, what was the Elvis Presley thing? Yeah. Okay, Jailhouse Rock. Um, there were two songwriters who wrote several songs for Elvis Presley, Hound Dog, um, Poison Ivy, and other things. And they started taking over, but then nothing happened. I think there was a reading that was done um, with maybe Zero Must Step or his son at one point. That's it. The, the, the music's pretty bad, and the estate hasn't allowed anything to happen. I'm sorry, that's not on a mic. People watching this on YouTube in the future, email us on Ask a Librarian if you have that same question, and Mark or I will be able to draft a response to you right away. Okay. Yes? Do you have any materials in the collection regarding the um, recording that Bernstein made with Carreras and Takanawa? There could be correspondence in the collection. I Again, I didn't look into that um, for this presentation. So I would have, I will say the finding aid for the Bernstein collection is available online. So you can actually read the document that describes all of the contents of the Bernstein collection, um, see who whose correspondence appears there and whose doesn't. Um, and what box you would go to to investigate that kind of question. Yes. I know that um, another Steven is planning on making a remake of the movie. Do you have any feelings why? You mean Steven Spielberg is planning yeah. to? Yes. <laughs> yes, Steven Spielberg is remaking the film. Um, the last thing I saw about it was a few months ago when they had the open casting call for the leads um, as to why they're doing it because it'll make money and it's a, it's a great, <laughs> because cause that's what we do now. We, we, we remake great movies and, and great musicals. Um, I don't have any personal thoughts on it. I, I, I'll go watch it. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Kate. Thank uh, you.